Welcome to Being the Genuine Athlete podcast, where we inspire those who aim for excellence in life and want to understand the how and what it takes to be a champion in life. My name is Jura Koschak. My purpose, dedication and commitment is to activate your potential, that you understand the ego through your sport and life situations. So I share and give you the tools to be just this, the genuine athlete. Are you ready to tune in? Hello, dear listeners. We are back in the Being the Genuine Athlete podcast. Today I'm hosting Chris Plour. He's a coach, businessman, father, husband, He has worked with many top athletes, well-known companies, celebrities, moms, dads, even military special ops. Uh, As a former master trainer and presenter, he has created and presented content both nationally and internationally on the mental and physical aspects of training for peak performance in all areas of life. So as a former chief executive with men's teams and organizations, he has mentored many men to find their authentic self and create leadership qualities which they could bring to their families, communities, and businesses. Let's salute, let's invite Chris Plort and continue. Three, <laughs> two, one, cut. Yeah, there are big action. Yeah. yeah. Hello, our listeners and viewers of being the Genuine Athlete Podcast. Today I have a special guest, my man, as I could say, Chris mm-hmm. Lord. That's Lord with a P. <laughs> Oh, thanks for having me, Jer. It's great to be here. Thank you. I'm honored and amazed when I have these guests that have done so much and achieved uh, like consequently in the material world, but more importantly, in the interior world mm. uh, that you are then able to live it and not just have it for a certain amount of your time in life period, and then you lose it again, but that you have the fundamentals. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny, you know, you said that and what, what came to me is, is I think we're always, uh, always learning and becoming more vulnerable and, and really uh, able to go into that discomfort, that disease within ourselves, that frustration, you know, and then go, okay, but the more we do it, we know that we're getting ready for something bigger. There's something more coming, you know, it's the, the disturbance before that next kind of leveling up, so to speak. So I think a lot of people don't fully understand that, but it's one of the things I love to work with my clients on is, yeah, it's not always about the control. It's about the, 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 the vulnerability of it all. And that's where the growth happens. So. Yeah, tell mm. me about it. I've been there a lot. Uh, <laughs> as an athlete, in professional athlete in table tennis mm-hmm. and dealing with all the fast speed of the sport and expectations and wishes and goals and, you know, uh, desires. And right. yet again, being in the journey, enjoying in the game. I needed like, I think, 20 years of training and matches that I finally began to enjoy in the journey. So I know that you're yeah. all about that. Uh, I always yeah. said, even when I didn't understand the, like my salute at the end, my goodbye was always enjoy in whichever mm-hmm. language uh, I was mm-hmm. uh, communicating. So please expand your knowledge on the journey yeah. that we begin to touch certain teams. Yeah. Well, I think, I think part of the, the journey is really understanding those, <clears throat> the voices in your head, you know, the judge that, that comes in and talks to us and kind of, tries to keep us down that negativity below the line type of ways of doing things. And then there's kind of the, the sage or the, the um, Jedi as some people like to call it, which is more of the right brain way of being, you know, and I, I, I actually just had a client not too long ago who was a tennis coach and very successful tennis coach. Um, and he's in his, you know, late sixties and, and, coaching these amazing high school. He had several state championships under his belt, but he, he called me and he was saying, listen, you know, I still play and I still play a lot. And he goes, I, there's this voice that really gets, gets really hard. And, and it just beats me up all the time when I'm playing. Right. And, and what we identified was that judge that he's been carrying with him since he was a boy. And even though he's reached a level of, so to speak, success, he's kind of tired of, of going through life 
hearing that all the time and beating himself up and not really enjoying the process of the game. And so what we got to do over time, and this does, it's not immediate, you have the insight, but then it's, it's the work, like, you know, we're progress the periodization programs as athletes have and so on and so forth. It's the boot camp for your brain. It's identifying the judge and saying, I see you, you are right there. I get you now. Can we move to the right side? Can we use more of the sage, the compassion, the innovator, the person that can speak more lovingly to ourselves? Because if we're able to do that and switch that programming, which by the way, the programming has in, been instilled in us prior to the age of 20 by other endeavor other people in our lives right our mentors our parents our uncles our aunts our people that shaped us now what we get to do is reprogram burning new neuro neural pathways in our brain in order to come about not only to be more successful but to be happier but to be uh, you know live longer all of these things we get to do now is is recognizing what we don't want and moving towards what we want in life so that we can be all those things I just mentioned. So mm. yeah. nicely put and uh, based on all the experience and everything, of course, it's, it's more, uh, it has the weight when you explain yeah. it like this and because you've lived it, you've coached others, many of them and had success uh, of this traveling from the right to the, uh, from the left to the right side. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. it takes miles, kilometers, and years uh, and we come from somewhere um, like we are all children we were all children and we come from our parents the way that parents work with us according to their level of subconsciousness mm -hmm. um, that has influenced and impacted our lives then accordingly we want to live in our adulthood and achieve some things of course Right. But this subconsciousness that stays as a survival mode in the childhood and then coming, it's, it's not the same as sage and judge, but we cannot simplify it like that because it's right. parts of the brain where the different sides of this exist, what, what we mentioned the terminology wise. Uh, so please continue to explain maybe a bit of your um, personal story about your father, mm. because in my case, my dad. Uh, when I was three or two or three years of age, I went into the beach, you know, on, on, on the, in the sea, in the ocean. It was a shallow one. No kids can ever do any harm there. But he was so afraid because that was his fear. So when mm. he found me after an hour or two searching and I was just playing with my friends in a campsite, you know, on a beach on an island, uh, mm -hmm, summertime, mm -hmm. uh, then he shouted on me and he gave me all of his anger and frustration and worries and fear. Right. So he was a bully at me. He should have been doing yeah. it himself, not to a three-year-old innocent child, but he didn't know yeah. better or he didn't know even. Mm -hmm. So right. I was my whole life, like you mentioned, I was a bully. So I still sometimes wake up and I tell myself, you didn't drink water. Hmm. Okay. Now I'm, you know, more and more listening this inner voice. I'm controlling, managing it more mm -hmm. um, and getting out of that old subconsciousness survival type of being into more sage-like yeah. and understanding yeah. this softness, compassion, empathy towards yourself at first. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, <laughs> yeah. I mean, first of all, for you to recognize that, which most people don't, you know, they go through their whole life with this programming, but not really understanding where it came from right but it's first identifying oh that happened my dad yelled at me at this point he was projecting anger onto you which is the cover-up for his deep-rooted fear oh my god i lost my son the 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 all of these things going in his brain my son's gone my son you know blah 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 and then when he saw you instead of embracing you and going oh thank God you're okay. It was more of, I never want you to do that again. That, that the fear, the anger came out on you and created a response, a trauma response that you took with you for the rest of your life, because you never wanted to feel that again. Right. That was such a horrible feeling that he projected onto you that you reacted to other people in that same situation in a, in that particular way. 
So the first thing when, when I hear that with, with clients is I'll say, and I'll talk about my story in just a moment, is they did the best job with the tools that they were given. Yes. So immediately when we, when we understand that, it becomes uh, compassion. You're, you're activating the right side of the brain. Right. When you can see your dad just had, he was taught a certain way and he did what he knew. And that's the best he knew how to do. If we can believe that our people, our higher ups, our mentors, our parents did what they, the best job they could, we're halfway there. Right. Instead of holding them accountable and trying to project our anger and saying, well, you did this to me. Therefore, my life turned out like this. That's victim mentality when we do that, right? And unfortunately, that just triggered a lot of your listeners right now, but it's, it's, it's reality. It's the acceptance of it first and foremost, right? And I don't mean to trigger people, but it just is part of growth. When we see our unresolved triggers that happen within us, we get an opportunity to go, oh, there you are. I get to work on you. You know, it's about Peter Crone says, life will present you with the people and the circumstances that will show you where you are not free, right? Mm -hmm. That's what life does. They show you where you're internally not free. And those people will keep coming into your life. And those situations will keep showing up in your life until you have the courage to look at those. And that's ownership right there. Yeah. So for, for me, you know, I I'm, I'm out in Los Angeles, California right now. Um, I've been out here for about 25 years. I grew up in the Boston area, Boston, Massachusetts, which is the East Coast, mm-hmm. um, very kind of blue collarish town, a um, lot of manly men, so to speak, you know, and it was all about not showing your emotions. It was all about being in this place of man up, suck, suck it up, don't show people your weaknesses and get to work, you know. Now, my dad wasn't, again, a great man, huge heart. He still is, but he didn't really show his emotions at all. He just kind of kept them inward. You know, um, he had, when I realized some of the stuff that he went through losing his mom and then losing my sister, we all went through that. Um, he had, he had some rough traumas that he, that he, he, he went through in his life. And so, but he was always there for us. He showed up. And so when I was a kid and being a very sensitive kid, um, I thought there was something wrong with me being in elementary school because I would cry at such a, at the drop of a hat. I was like, man, there's something wrong. Why am I so sensitive and I'm crying all the time? So I convinced my, literally convinced my parents to get me therapy. I was like, you, you got it. You got, we got to fix this. We got to fix this issue that I have, this problem that I have of being sensitive. Right. So, so how foolish is that right now? But it's, it's reality. It's, it's what I thought was wrong. So I went to therapy and I finally just said, you know what, little boy, my little boy, shush, we're going to become the man that we were supposed to be that everybody around us tells us that we should be. So get into sports, be the best sport player you can be, no matter what that is, go to college, get a business degree, work for a great corporation or corporations, make X amount of dollars, buy a house here near your parents and everything's going to be fine. Well, that was the, that was the supposed path. And I was well on my way to doing that until I got into these positions and I was like, Oh, there's something wrong here. I'm not happy there. This job is sucking me dry. And I worked for some great corporations, no fault of their own, but it wasn't what I was supposed to be doing until I did that a couple of few times when I realized my life's path is about being a coach first in the fitness industry and then training trainers and then becoming a coach with businesses and and individuals and different groups and so on and men's groups and so on and so forth. So I had to come to the realization that my truth wasn't being lived. And when my truth wasn't being lived, my energy was, was drained, getting drained very quickly. And I didn't under, and I wasn't, my cup wasn't full because of that. So I had to learn to really open myself up, take off the masks, peel back the layers and say, what is it that your soul is supposed to do in this world? 
What is it that's going to make you truly happy? What is it that's going to make your cup full? Because when I was able to live that, then I was able to give so much more and be in service of others. So yeah, that's the short story. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah, it's a lot of mileage and years and uh, ups and downs. And that's the part of life, the journey. Um, yeah. I also remember how uh, practically from that moment on, the traumatic moment mm -hmm. with my dad, uh, it got me to live on a beach in Dominican Republic, 10,000 miles away from, no, 10,000 kilometers away from my home, actually, because right. I was always searching for that lost affection, love moment with my dad uh, that got yeah. somehow struck there, cut there. Uh, and I'm still mm -hmm. in this healing process. And I understood how, like you mentioned now, the same was my story. Like I was always fighting or uh, conditioning myself to get that uh, attention back and love uh, and yeah. training my ass off being an athlete already with the age of eight, nine years of age, like a kid, yeah. uh, like with age of 10, um, 11, I started to train two times per day table tennis. It's like, it's yeah. an, an amount of fuel and energy that is fueled by certain hate or powerlessness because you're a kid. And then you go on being a, like older high school and then uh, university and graduation, everything and getting the job and everything done. Yeah. Like you said, checking the dots and the, the marks on the open boxes, but it doesn't mm -hmm. give you neither your dad back, neither did the bitch give me, give me back my right. dad. He, in a way, in sort of in the process also passed away. Uh, and I'm realigning, reaffirming and reconnecting again with him, with myself, mm -hmm. right? By acknowledging, by lifting up my wounded subconsciousness my wounded judge and bully that yeah. sort of i'm getting more mature and not only fighting because there's a lot of uh please share uh, your experience on this there's a lot of especially athletes if we stay in the athlete sport world yeah that are wounded that are so vulnerable they don't want to not even yeah. admit they just go and push and when they lose they're going to oh. train more and they're going to find more sit the mm. f down slow the <laughs> f down listen to your body yeah Stop yeah it. yeah Making that so true so you know my my athletic story um as an athlete you know i played high school football and college ball my high school football team was ranked division one number one in the country I think we had two losses my entire high school career. So I was shown what that caliber is pretty quickly, pretty early on in life. Um, college, I played, you know, college football, ran track, I wrestled. Um, and then I got into endurance sports. So I was a cyclist, a triathlete, ultra endurance uh, athlete as well. Um, competed at a, at a pretty good level. Um, and, you know, would train six, seven, sometimes seven days a week, you know, and, and 20, 30 hours a week, some, some weeks, right. Because that was what I thought was bringing me joy. It was like, I had to go out and suffer every single day. Right. And, and, and the, what I realized was that unless I suffered, I wasn't worthy enough right? Like, mm -hmm. unless I went into that suffering state and had yeah. to prove, I had to prove myself on a daily basis. And in order to look at my self worth, that mm -hmm. was my old story. Yeah. And I had no idea I was living it right until one day I'm sitting and I took my dragged my family up to the mountains uh, to do an x which is an off-road triathlon, right? Trained for it, did it, um, had some major falls and was bloodied and it was my brakes went and going down a ski slope. I had literally had to run the bike cause I was going, I couldn't stop cause it was going too fast. And somehow I, I got to the end of that triathlon and I, I, I made the podium, but as I stood on the podium and I kind of looked at my family and, and it was a great adventure. It was cool to be able to do that. So don't get me wrong. I mean, there was part of me that was like, this is, this is awesome. But there was something about that moment when I looked at my family and I looked where I was and I said to myself, I'm no happier today than I was yesterday, even though I, I, I made this podium step. Right. And, and I had to really take a hard look at my relationship with athletics and fitness and what that was for me. Right. I was doing it 
two workouts a day or whatever the case, three sometimes to prove something to myself. When I finally was able to step back and go, you don't have to prove anything to anybody anymore. You are worthy right now in this moment. You can be happy and enjoy this journey instead of going from destinate goal to goal to goal to goal without even taking in the win of it and just going, no, okay, good. Next. Okay, good. Next. Okay. And I was doing that in business. I was doing that in, in, in everything. And it wasn't until I, again, found that, that moment and then eventually got a coach for myself. And the coach's number one thing she started working with me on was you got to slow down, slow down, slow down. And my limiting belief of slowing down, if I slow down, I'm going to lose it all. Everything's going away. My family, my business, everything's going to go away. And, and, and that was a story I made up in my mind. The limiting beliefs we all make up in our minds based upon past experiences. So when I was able to just be instead of do, things started coming my way and these beautiful gifts from the world and universe started saying, hey, I got something for you. And thank you for slowing down and listening and paying attention to what's around you as opposed to trying to force and control and do everything all the time. And it was a very humbling, hard uh, process to go through, but here we are today. <laughs> so, uh-huh. Yeah, and, and even more, the issue is that a lot of people achieve amazing big results in life in all areas, and especially then athletes. And then right. we are sort of fooled. Mm -hmm. We are driven into that uh, fake world that it works. And right. that they are happy and that they achieve and they have the fame and celebrity and money and everything. But And also a lot of athletes completely, they have chronic pain, not only on emotional, mental level, but also on financial level, because they, they are not aware that the more they worry, the less they'll have. And the more they fight right. for it and the more they'll train, the less they enjoy, the less they have everything. Right. But then, then comes some NBA, NFL, whatever player or some athlete, Olympic uh, athlete, and says, yeah, I just enjoy. And it's so far away for an athlete that's suffering, that's not even admitting that is vulnerable because we live under these predetermined conditions of society. Men can, even athletes, not even men, but female as well cannot show their vulnerability it's all yeah. stiff and then they're like how can i enjoy in this freaking world if i'm hating myself hating the run that i do i need to do 20k per day i need to do this yeah, protein yeah. that shit how can i enjoy and then you go into a yeah. game and you're frustrated and it's all overwhelming i still just want to stay a bit in this side yeah that we that we show this scenery that the listeners, the athletes will like be struck because we need to trigger them. If, if yeah. somebody does, is not triggered, either that person is so much blind or yeah. he has a lot of triggers in, in, it, in him, yeah. in her. So they need yeah. to be triggered. So in that way, please um, continue the explanation mm. regarding this, of like staying in the suffering because it's mm. all self-aligning and self-proclaiming and self um alimenting like feeding yeah. self-feeding itself right. the beast the beast is right. feeding itself <laughs> so so uh, uh, an illusion a lot of people have is i have to continue doing it a certain way in order to get up that next mountain in my life like this is and 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 the the contra indicated or the 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 other thing we can say to ourselves is what got you here is not going to get you there right what got you here is not going to get you there and when we can fully understand that and believe that and go you know what i need to do it a different way i can take some of the tools with me right? I'm not saying abandon what you know, or that deep well of wisdom that has gotten you to this place. But ask yourself, how fulfilled are you right now? Like, look at all areas of your life, look at you financially, spiritually, personally, professionally, physically, how your body is, and then take all those areas. And on a scale of one to 10, 
10 being I am full, I am happy, I am successful, I am great. One being I am just ready to end it all, right? On a scale of one to 10, how fulfilled are you in all those areas? Just come up with a rough number, say it to yourself. So when I asked this, this question <clears throat> to a couple of months ago to 50 CEOs, guess what the average number was? Two. 50 successful CEOs that are all making well into the seven digits in their businesses and careers. Five or six was the average. A lot of them were below five. Four. Yeah, but that's an official version that they are not right? aware of. It's probably two. Right. Two three, and yeah. probably exactly what you just said. Right. And most likely we're, we're up in that believe. number so that we can feel better. They want to believe it. Right. Yeah. They believe so that when, it's but, nine and 10, but they admit that right. it's maybe five, six, but reality. All right. And, and, you know, and fortunately, you know, they weren't, they were in a room amongst peers. They were all in this vulnerable place with a lot of tears and a lot of things that already had come out. Mm -hmm. But with that, that question is very eye opening because when I ask this question, it's like, okay, if you're at a five, how much do you think you're able to, of your best self, are you able to give to your kids? Of your best self, are you able to give to your business, right? Of your best self, are you able to give to your physical body, right? And how you feel, right? You're not operating on that highest level. So what we get to do when I work with these individuals or groups, or whatever, is start to peel back what it is that they can boundary up and eliminate in their lives or invite in new habits they get to create in their lives so that that number slowly goes up. And here's the thing, right? If I said, and all you, your listeners could probably relate to this, you know, if I said, all right, we're going to go and do a marathon, you know, in six months or 12 months, right? And you haven't even run a mile but that's okay. You know, we're going to train you carefully. We're going to add a little bit more in 10% rule every single week, right? In order to get you to that place. It's going to take a little time, but we're going to get you there. The impatience that most people feel is I want that 10 tomorrow. Well, you're not going to run the marathon tomorrow. Commit to this over the next six to 12 months, right? Of, of doing those things, of going through the process of enjoy, starting to enjoy the journey of starting to feel the pain of what you've been not, not able to look at, right? Courage isn't about uh, pushing forward and bearing your feelings. Courage is about being vulnerable and actually able to feel the feels that come up, right? Actually able to feel the emotions that come up. And in the middle of those emotions, I promise you is where freedom lies if you're able to sit with them. But here's the other thing is these emotions never will go away, but they will get less and less and less and less until they are a little bit of a whisper, but they stay with you so that you get to be in service to others so that you get to tell your story so that people can relate so that people, you are able to look back and say, I am in full service and I am doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing in this world because I went through that internal journey of, of growth. I had the courage to look inward and not hope for something external to come my way. There was something inside of me that I was able to look at in order to be the best version of myself. And now I am at a nine or 10 on a regular basis. I am truly happy. I am successful. I am in service. It's a, it's a huge process, but it's a process well worth it. It's as, as Joseph Campbell would say, it's our hero's journey. <laughs> yeah. And, and that's so. the thing. Thank you for uh, elaborating and expressing it in this way, coming from the subconsciousness that in a childhood was adapted and adjusted and trained and programmed to mm -hmm. survive with all the nonsense or with the level that was able to be there from our parents or anyone else, teachers and, and coaches. Mm -hmm. And then when we grow older, when we are more adult, we get into this zone of not wanting to feel because as a child, you don't yeah. want to feel what you're feeling. And right. that's how and why many athletes and of course, in general public, it's closed up 
but it's there where it lies. We say yeah. uh, the, where the wound is, that's where the sun or the healing enters. Uh, you mentioned right. this vulnerability and emotions. It's all of this. And it's so much color and so much pleasure because if you close out the pain, you cannot also feel the pleasure. We don't have two pathways in our bodies. We have one nervous mm. system. And in this nervous system, you feel pain and pleasure. Yep. So the more you yep. block and resist, vulnerability, resist emotions, whatever they are, resist pain, you cannot feel neither with Netflix or with winning a gold medal or being on the podium or right. everybody adoring you, you're not gonna yeah. feel shit because you've closed up the yeah. channels that actually yeah. give you something. So feeling yeah. everything is such a liberating, it's an emotion itself, it's above emotions, mm -hmm. that liberation mm -hmm. of coming out of the closet, I'm not saying about being inclined yeah. to either either uh, gender your, your emotional but, closet that's right yeah, like this emotional <laughs> closet that that uh, so many athletes i was suffering and when i figured out oh my god i want i want to give this to every athlete because i knew what i went through like suffering mm -hmm. for nothing i i I, mm. I kicked the table tennis table at the age of almost 18 years of age i kicked it because i lost a point on a training Training. I was training, not even a match. Yeah. And I yeah. kicked the table tennis table and I broke my big toe on my foot. It, it snapped. <laughs> like I had a casket on for a month. I couldn't go to a national championship. I couldn't drive the car. I couldn't do anything because I was in the middle of mm. learning and having these structures. Mm -hmm. So these mm -hmm. impacts got me like, and, and the more I got into these suffering points and vulnerabilities and resisting them, of course, not accepting it. I don't want to feel, I just want to feel the win. I want to, and then I will feel happy. Then I will get that. Then, I, then, 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 then. When I stopped yeah. and I like, and I checked back, I read my journal, my diary from like, yeah. when I was 27 ish, I read my journal from when I was 12, 13, 15, 16. I wrote journals sometime here and there. Mm -hmm. And it struck me. I had the same crisis when I was 12, when I was 13, when I was 14, when I was yep. 16, the same pattern. And I was like, ah, then I began to connect the dots. Then I began to be on the sage part. Then I began to mm -hmm. enjoy. Then I began mm -hmm. to elevate, mature in my subconsciousness and not be a victim anymore, not be the bully anymore. Of course, that's a, that's a process. I'm still going through it. But right, right. It's, it's there. It's this liberating that I began to enjoy without the result, without any resistance, being in all of it. Please right. touch these points of, uh, because we had a pre-podcast date and you said, it's a shame that we didn't record it. Well, I did sort of, <laughs> some, I did some notes. So please, yeah, because yeah. you mentioned, you, you said yeah. such a strong uh, uh, phrase that identifying the resistance, reframing yep. it. Right. Please. Yeah, it's, it's, it is, it's perspective shift is all it is, right? We can't change what has happened to us in our lives or for us, what sounds better, right? To us, life has happened to us. It's fucking with me. It keeps showing me. I can't get a break. Da, 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 da. Or it's happening for us. And it's just about us slowing down enough to look at those things like you finally did said, oh, these patterns keep coming up. These circumstances keep showing up time and time and time again. And I'm sick and tired of these. What is this that I'm not looking at? I'm going to slow down and feel into what it is that keeps happening because I want to get to a different place now in a different way. I want to go on this different journey, but I need to accept where I'm at first and look at life as happening for me as opposed to to me right most of my most of my clients i work with that are looking to shift patterns i take on this little life journey <clears throat> where i say what are the four to six major things that have happened in your life right they could be things that you might not wish upon anybody because it was really hard for you, or they could be complete and total blissful things that an adventure that you went on that was just amazing. And it flowed beautifully. Most of the people will write down something very traumatic that happened, but then we write down those moments of what happened and we say, okay, what, what did you feel in that moment? What were those feelings that came out? Right. 
well, I was so scared and I was grieving the loss of, or I thought my life was going to end or, you know, and it was just so awful. And, and I was so frustrated at this point, or it was just pure flow and it just was beautiful and just everything just lined up and all these things started to happen. And I got to meet all these people or whatever. And so we look at these life less and we look at how we felt. And then we say, okay, what are the, the things you learned about yourself, right? What are the lessons you extracted from, from these moments? Well, I learned how to be resilient. I learned that life, it's all happening for me. I learned that, oh my, you know, that this person was here to bless me and to show me how to live and to how to really embrace life or that I wasn't slowing down enough. Therefore I got this sickness or whatever the case may be. Okay, great. Now, what are the gifts you now carry that were unleashed because of that, that you went through? So what are your gifts now? So then you got, I am extremely compassionate with others. I am a leader. I learned how to step up and be a leader in my life because no one else was doing it. And I formed this, this, and this, so, you know, so you're getting all of these incredible moments of, of your self growth because of these situations in that moment, when you shift that perspective, if this didn't happen to me, if I didn't grow up in this plane, if I didn't have these parents, I have these parents. I grew up here because this situation has happened to me so that I could finally learn and look at my karma in life and do what I was meant to do. Because I think if we look at all, I know if we look at all of these things that happen for us and we put them into play along with our passions, we're able to take those things and then be in service in some way to the world. You know, and I think that's our hearts as humans, our greatest desire is to really be in service in some way, shape or form, right? We look at how can people acknowledge us? I don't think it's about even that. It's about watching someone get it and having the insight. So it's, it's that language we use internally, how we can view situations, problem versus challenge, Problem is a victim mindset. Challenge is going to be a growth mindset, an ownership mindset. Thank you for being here. You switch it immediately. And then you go into a place of, ah, this is, this is why I'm living right now. Right. And it's, again, it's not always, it's not going to happen right away, but if we can fully look at that and wake up every day and say, what, how can I grow? How can I enjoy this journey? life is going to be so much more meaningful and we're going to be so much more impactful because of it. So, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly like that. Um, I always had, since I was a kid and I remember playing football with my friends already, you know, storing some of the memory. Mm -hmm. I need what, mm -hmm. what is this situation is going to help me evolve in life or where am I going to use this memory that it will ignite yeah. me. And then observing my dad, like, oh, my dad is like this. I need to learn from him to be a dad. I was five yeah. or six. I had sort of things in my mind, in my process of working like that on that level. And then later on, when I really stepped up the game and stepped completely not outside of the box, but outside, outside of all the boxes and challenged myself, shit got going. But shit in a good way, because mm -hmm. I finally saw how much and what is in me, in what way is in me. And I've gotten into dire situations and uh, yeah. life-threatening maybe as well in some cases. You know, clients and everything going, happening, surging, a lot of triggers. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So in that way, I always had a part of my brain, like a part of like an eye, like maybe it was third eye, whatever it was there. Yure, this is for you. This is experience for you that you will bring forward, that you will take forward, that you will share, that you will evolve from and empower yourself and eventually others because you had this experience. How can That's you right. help others if you didn't have an experience? So it's happening to you just in order to have a more a juicy book written afterwards in that That's case. Right. So that took away a lot of the pressure and a lot of the suffering already. Mm -hmm. And then further on what happened because I want to touch now more the journey on and this unleashing the soul desire, like you mentioned last time on our uh, first date and podcast. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, 
uh, a lot of people have excuses and, and are, all, all are justified. Like, all I know is how to live like this. My parents, my dad live like this. I learned this, I learned that. I don't know how it is to be a winner. I don't know how it is to enjoy. Yeah, well, mm. there's so many people who have written autobiographies, who are sharing, who are helping. But yeah. if you always turn yeah. a blind eye and you always close yourself down, you don't you actually don't listen to what is available what is present because there's so much available right like in my case and please then share your story and your experiences living liberated life uh being outside of this closed mind brain because this is 10 centimeters you cannot get far you know a to b point (laughs) if you're always pondering and procrastinating in your mind and avoiding and justifying and stuff right living out of this is breathing will touch breathing it's completely different breathing. Finally, you expand. I expanded my breathing 50%, if not more. And of course, mm-hmm. additional exercises and the work that I do with breathing. But waking up different, going to bed different, acknowledging food different, uh, breathing air different, drinking water different, doing whatever it is, maybe so simple, but so beneficial to life and mm-hmm. understanding I am here in service. Either it's in this way, either it's in that way. I found my calling through talking as you might see, but, yeah, uh, yeah. And, exp- and expressing, but other people have found it through art or sport or whatever, but we are here to show everyone else what's possible. And it exists. We, in 2022, sorry, you cannot use the excuse. I don't know how it looks like. It's yeah. so evident, I think, how yeah, to be yeah. unleashed. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. You know, I think everybody has to really look within, first of all, and kind of use some of the tools that are available to us, right? If we're going to sit back and reread the chapters that we've already written, read, you know, dozens of times, we're not going to grow. But it's about waking up and saying, I want to start writing some new chapters. I want, I'm going to start getting into action and trying new things, even though it might not fit perfectly right away. You know, you mentioned the breath, right? Breath work, for example, meditation, writing, um, um, joining a team, you know, a mastermind, a men's team, a woman's team, uh, something that's going to shake up your way, your habits that aren't serving you any longer. You know, reading some books, listening to other podcasts, that's that's the key if we're not if we're visualizing this is what i want my life to be or this is what i feel it should be but we're not and we you know you can use the law of attraction and you know we heard about that and we read that the book and you know visualizing what we want da, da, da. but what they were missing was john astroff proclaimed the he said you're they were missing the law of goya Right. And if you don't have the law of Goya, nothing is going to come to you. It's get off your ass. Right. When we can really connect to that and go, okay, what action steps am I taking on a daily basis? And they don't have to be major, huge things. It's just commit to three to five a day of having a coffee with somebody, of reading a book, of, 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 writing down, you know, getting, doing morning pages of, of, of waking up and just writing freely what you need to write of, you know, take, I mean, look, we have everything available to us at our fingertips, right? Oh, I've been on zoom enough. It's right there for you. Just c- jump in fully and say, I want to now live the life I was supposed to live. And when we can jump into that and say, I'm going to go all in, not just in action, but I'm going to actually feel the process and enjoy this journey of becoming my greatest self. Then, like you said, life just starts to open up in such a beautiful way, right? We start to see everything that's around us. And these people not only are here to to teach us and show us our triggers, but then these amazing other people are coming in to support us and hold us that are like-minded and we get to grow with as well. So those tools, those things are right there. It's just a matter of stepping into it and say, what are three to five things a day I can do in order to make this, this happen? But there's a but. 
there's still this resistance. The old subconscious, mm-hmm. the old neural pathways, the old chemistry yes. is still resisting. And you have all these tools, but because the thing is that, like we mentioned probably, the beast is feeding itself and it says, yeah. well, well, you shouldn't have resistance. How not? Well, if you do wait, okay. like you said, of course you have resistance if, and you grow. If Yeah. Well, look at, you can't look at, if you want to get physically fit and you're a lot of your listeners are athletes, most of them, what do you need? Resistance. You go to the gym, you lift some weights, you go for a run, you go for a swim, you ride a bike, you go run up a hill. What is that? It's resistance. If you want to get physically fit, you need resistance. There's no way around it. And now, if you can take emotional, sorry to interrupt, but on the emotional side of it or mental, it's difficult to accept that your resistance is your prior dad, your dad, your mom, your abuser Mm -hmm. or someone or your attacker. And you say, I thank for this resistance, but it's 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 gotten on your way. Like you mentioned before, it happens at you or for you and Mm -hmm. how you reframe Mm -hmm. it. And then you say, wow, this is what made me and this is what will make me in the future. And you use that resistance. Please right. Continue. Well, yeah, no, exactly what you just said. You know, you it's the reframing. And again, I don't expect your listeners to kind of go, okay, I get it. They might get an insight today or, or whenever they're listening to this and go, okay, I get it. Now, what is it? Now get out into the world and say, there you are, resistance. Thank you for being here, right? I see you. Like, I know it's hard. It's a lot. It feels suffocating sometimes, but there's, there's no way around it. There's only through it. Like it's reframing your relationship with that resistance that comes up, like fully looking at it and going, I need this in order to become a stronger, grittier, better version of myself. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and holding that and with compassion, not going, Oh, I want to step up and I'm going to fight you. I fought for decades. I want to dance the rest of my life, right? I want to learn to dance in in this world, in this life, and not necessarily just go, it's going to be combative. It's going to be this. It's something we get to kind of flow with. And I think that's when life gets much more flowy is when we learn and and look at that on a regular basis. So did that answer your question? Yes. (laughs) Yes. yes. <laughs> okay. Not only mine. I hope that uh, for many <laughs> others that will begin to climb uh, this mm-hmm. mountain of life uh, in this compassionate way and yeah. accept embracing the the mountain, the steepness and the environment, and not just fighting with it. I remember when I was in a in my university for sport, uh, we went uh, to uh, mountainous regions uh, of our country, Slovenia, the Julian Alps. Uh, and I come mm. from the more, more eastern part of the country where everything is flat. So for me, a small hill was already not, right. not physically demanding, but mentally, emotionally, because I needed to, I had that resistance, which I never had. I had a flatness around me in my childhood. So then I went, I was age of 19 or 20 ish. And I went with a group of 10 people. I was the only one bugging first two, three days. I was screaming mm-hmm. in the mountains. You don't do that. I was shouting, I was uh, abusing myself in, a, in <laughs> nasty words, in um, um, what's it, a swearing, cursing. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Then we went onto a cliff or something, right side, 1,000 meters, like one kilometer down cliff. And the left side, 1,000, I was on that ledge. And I'm like, <gasps> you know, without breath. And I've done many, I, I was a national champion. I did that, right, I, looked, right. I did yoga when I was 14, 15 years of age. Mm-hmm. But when I was there in that resistance, then it's flipped me. How yep. to embrace this risk-taking situation, right. the environment. And further on, when I was a year after, we went on a, on a free diving without you know, the oxygen bomb tanks uh-huh, uh-huh. and we needed to dive. And the first day we had a big uh, test so that they could put us in four different groups you mm-hmm, know the levels mm-hmm. and i was in the last group with 10 other ladies one guy mm. and 10 ladies because i couldn't swim with the scuba dive device uh, this equipment i didn't know how to breathe with that snorkel or something yeah. and i didn't know how to dive and i was 20 and more but then yeah. when i when i understood how to calm down my mind how to focus how the uh, the water surface brings together all the points in one point. And I was just like, oh, I'm here. Okay. And then I dived to 50 yeah. meters below the right. level of right. the ocean. I watched up, I looked up and I'm like, ah, Beautiful. I need to get up. So yeah, stay focused, yeah. 
Don't lose yeah. it yet. Stay focused. Yeah. But this is somehow how I began to embrace this liberty bit by bit to, to acclimatize to this mountain, to the steepness, to resistance, mm -hmm. uh, and mm -hmm. to begin to enjoy. It took, it's still yeah. taking me, but I get it. It's accumulating more and more to enjoy. Hey, I, I love that. And, you know, it's, it's such a, 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 a heart opening thing to look at is when we can find that thing we can associate with. And I think we're all, we all have these stories that we need to tell just like you. You know, and I'll give an example about a personal, one of my clients who was going through something very personal. She's going through a separation with her, with her hubby and, um, uh, the, and they have a kid, which makes it even more challenging, you know, and we got to a session one time and she was saying, you know, I'm just feel suffocated and I'm so angry every time he does this, right. He does that. He does this. And I was like, okay, let's look at a time when you felt like that in your life, maybe as a child, and she goes, okay. I go, how old were you? And she thought and stopped for a minute. She goes, I was like four. And I was like, okay. And what happened? She goes, well, my older brothers were always taking control and not letting me do anything. And therefore what I would do is I would retreat and go off and do something on my own. I go, well, how did that make you feel? Very angry. And, but how did you survive not being able to have a say in anything? And it, it goes, well, I just went and did my own thing. And I just held that anger in. So cut to decades later, she's in a marriage that she's seeing and her hubby is now bringing out these internal triggers within her. I go, do you see how your, your, your husband right now is lighting those same triggers that you never looked at your entire life. So all these relationships you went through in your life gave the exact same reaction internally, but you just turned away from it. Now you're in a marriage, you're in the middle of COVID, you're or just after it, and you're seeing how he is the same person he's always been, right? It's the one you married, the one you had a kid with, but now it's becoming surface for you. All this resistance is coming up to show you that you're not free somewhere in your life within yourself. So from that day forward, she was able to now look at that situation with her hubby and go, this is who he is. I can look beneath the anger and say, oh, I actually really felt sad. And when you do that, you're able to not meet it with anger. You're able to meet it with more compassion, switching it to the right brain. And you're able to see and feel that as not something that is happening to you. And now it's happening for you. How do I now navigate this? Because if she didn't, if she didn't have the courage to navigate it, right? All that stuff that comes up, some other relationship in her life at some other point down the road is going to show her that same exact thing once again, and again, and again, like you did when you kicked the table and you were able to look back and say, oh, this happened every few years, right? So it's either now or you can wait another few years or <laughs> wait a few years and then that living that half full cup, right? It's just, it's, it's that resistance again that we get to kind of just look and get stronger because of, so. Um, mm. Just before the end, uh, and then we'll conclude, have some points of conclusion. Um, I want to mm -hmm. touch the subject on the masculinity um, uh, because right. I've seen through the through my experience I'm 40, but uh, I've seen mm -hmm. I've read I've seen some history, um, and as I've come to understand, uh, men have resistance because it was genetically programmed in a way towards women, and uh, I've listened since 2010 when mm -hmm. I started a different kind of journey on my life, the energy wise and more intuitive wise. I've listened mm -hmm. from a coach, guru, and a, some sage, uh, wisdom person that ladies, time for ladies will come eventually after 2010. Yeah. yeah. That ladies will bring uh, down to earth the love and they will show to men how to love because men have kicked out ladies from the system since the Egyptians or even prior to them, the, for the, the ancient Egyptians, and have taken the reins. But uh, we cannot go forward without the ladies side by side. And I see this in yeah. the unity, uh, in, in accepting, not as a vulnerable thing to allow, allow, 
listen to that world, the word, but to have a lady beside you, because in the end, we need to uh, acknowledge that uh, every successful man has a more successful lady behind him, and she stay, she's, mm-hmm. uh, you know, uh, pointing the finger and doing the things. The man just thinks yeah. uh, that he yeah. is. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, you know, I've been in men's work for about 14 years, 15 years now, men's teams, organizations, and Primarily what we do, or you can call it masculine and understanding the feminine, right? And really trying to work with it. And, you know, a lot of us, we hold different masculine qualities. Some women have more masculine qualities than other men. So we look at, we look at these traits that we hold and we learn how to work with it. You know, um, one of the, one of the um, uh, weekends I went to, they gave this statistic and they said, if you were to measure the love of a household or the support of a, of a loving spouse, right. And you were able to put that in say a contract, a professional contract and say, okay, we're about to give you a $10 million contract, but because we know you have a loving supported spouse at home, we're going to give you $5 million more because that's how much more power that gives this, this individual, this professional athlete. So if we measure it in terms of money, right. I mean, which a lot of people can relate, it's worth millions of dollars more, right? So it's up to us to kind of say, how can we cultivate this relationship? Right. And I think you're right about, you know, what has happened in, in, in the patriarch of life and what the Romans did in the fall of, of women in the, the burying of um, all these, you know, even Jesus and the apostles and Mary Magdalene and so much stuff is out there. We're not going to get into that today, but we can do that another time. We look at how can we now allow and hold space for our feminine part of on either ourselves or our spouse to really kind of th- flourish and grow. Because if we look at it in leadership standpoint today, this isn't the leadership that's going to last throughout the world, throughout these higher organizations anymore. It's going to come from a much more heartfelt place. So us learning to work within the relationship, know that there is a difference between masculine and feminine, know that we can hold that space, allow this to happen, allow, when we look at relationships, we look at ourselves first And then we're able to move forth and forward with it, right? And know that that person that is there, we're not here to fix. They showed us the person they were from the moment we met them. And we're not here to fix or change or do anything. We're here to look at ourselves and say, is this the person we're going to spend the rest of our lives with? Is this my spiritual partner? Is this relationship something that I really want to cultivate and be with? Are we helping each other out? Or are we triggering each other to help us grow? And I know for us, my wife and I have been with her for 18 years, married for 16, two kids. Amazing. You know, we look at ourselves as a spiritual partnership now. Spiritual partnership means we help our spirits grow. We show each other. We're here to support each other to be the best versions of ourselves not to piss the other one off and go, even though we have our moments, of course we all do, but it's about working with as a team, as opposed to going, okay, we're going to do this, or you're going to do that. And we're going to do this. It's, it's the growth of our individual souls that really is going to help. And I think it's a reframing of you did this versus you did this versus we get to do this in unison with the rest of the world. So, yeah. Mm. And uh, I have the same kind of relationship and I see Mm. it crucial that you realign yourself just a bit as you can alone by yourself. And when you meet a peer, a person, a relationship person, partner, that's sort of on the same level that also did the work. And when these two get together, because if you don't do the work prior, you're going to do the work in the relationship. So it's better <laughs> of course, to, uh, clean yeah. some of the things. Um, so, well, um, yeah. Well, you know, it's funny though, just to speak on that relationship on, on the th- other things, I work with a lot of couples. I work with, I've worked with a bunch of men. I've worked with a bunch of women that hired me to do retreats. It's 
some, the, the thing about being working is not about, oh, this I'm doing the work. So they should do the work the same exact time I'm doing the work. They're going to be ready to do the work when they're ready to do the work. And there's nothing you can do to force that person to do the work until they are fully ready. Because if it's a force thing, no. it's not going to work out in your best favor. So yeah. just that space and hold and you model it, be the example, show the, the changes and the shifts that get to happen to you first, then see what follows in the near future. So yeah, that's a great point. We'll need to do another mm-hmm. uh, podcast uh, on the episode of um, on the theme of partnership relationship in athletes and how to have that spiritual kind of support. That's right. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's another debate that can be long. Yeah. I'm doing a whole day relationship training next month. So here in Los Angeles, but it's all about that. Yeah. So reconnecting. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. Well, to wrap it up, uh, you mentioned last time and I loved it uh, because this is the being the genuine athlete podcast. And I sort of mm-hmm. am really into and, and, and my intention is to bring out the genuinity in people. And you mentioned we live to have a genuinely good time. Uh, and mm. my client mentioned last time she was visiting her parents. She's over 30. And her parents said, what are you working on? And she's like, I don't have a job, but I have more money than when I had a job because I helped her and she's now creating and she's, you know, living the spiritual and more connected mm. life and consequently had more abundance. And then the parents said, because they are accustomed to only work, you know, physically and mentally. And then the parents said, well, uh, what are you just enjoying or what? And <sighs> she said, well, That's the point of life, I think, to work on myself, to be able to enjoy more and to genuinely have a good time. So maybe a couple of uh, points, steps uh, to give to the viewers. Uh, You mentioned slow down regarding some senses and and sensing yourself, illusion, Mm -hmm. breathing. Please elaborate. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's changing that that term. Well, not changing work. We get to do work. But it's, it's understanding that we get to do work and we get to have fun. We get to fall in love with the journey of becoming our greatest self. I'm not saying it's going to be easy, not saying you're not going to go through something, but yes, if your intention is to be happy, if your intention is to be joyful, if your intention is to continuously grow, then put all of that, yes to all of that, right? Right. And then we get to redefine work. And I think most people think this is suffering, right? Discipline, it doesn't have to be this suffering state that we get to be in. It doesn't have to constrict us. Discipline can actually mean or equal freedom within us. So if we're committing to ourselves and our growth and we're doing those things on a regular basis, we're like, yes, this is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm creating this spreadsheet or uh, going to this class or reading this book or working out on a regular basis so I can feel that openness and freedom within myself. So if we can get discipline and reframe what that actually means to most people, then I believe we all could have that freedom. We all could be joyful. We all could be happy, successful, and live at that cup full level of 10 on a regular basis. The best way to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Ah, thank you so much for having me. Mm -hmm. And and, uh, sageness that uh, (laughs) they will receive. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Follow me on being the Genuine Athlete Instagram and Facebook page. Share, like and comment and be genuine all the way.